Good afternoon, everybody. Can I please ask that you take your seats so we can get started with our next speakers? My name is Augustic Dunbar, and I will be presenting to you both Heather Goodnight and Patrick Flora. A little bit about Heather. She has over 20 years as a global sales and business development consultant, co-founder and president of Risk Centric Security, Poneman Institute, RMI Council, co-author and analyst of Net Diligence or Cyber Claims Report. And a bit about Patrick, um, information technologist for 37 years, database designer, statistical analysis and evidence-based medicine for 17 years, CTO and co-founder of Risk Centric Security, member of RIM Council, uh, distinguished fellow, Poneman Institute since 2012, and I now present to you your speakers, Heather Patrick. Awesome. All right. Hold on. Okay. Thank you, Augusta. Y'all hear me okay? Awesome. Okay. I thought I was going to be able to move around. This feels very. Us. But thank you all for staying, and uh, today we're going to talk about insurance and risk. So, um, can you see that? Okay. So, how many of you have seen the Liberty Mutual commercial where they have that cute blonde leaning up against the railing over what looks like a gleaming Hudson River with the pristine Statue of Liberty, and she says, you're car insurance policy is 22 pages long. Did you read it all? No, nope. only lawyers do that. So when you got rear-ended and you called them because you needed a tow, they said, turn to page five. When, when you looked at page five, did it say, great news, you're covered? No, it said, blah, 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 blah. Well, if you exchanged car with cyber, that's pretty much how our customers feel. So, in fact, actually, yesterday, PwC released, an, I guess, an article or something in an article about a survey they did where 59% of a group of customers they surveyed dropped their cyber insurance from last year. And their reasoning is because they said the product wasn't tailored to their specific risk, and it was too expensive. That is actually a comment we hear quite a lot. Another reason that people are frustrated with cyber insurance is because they're not the ones making the decisions. The decisions are being made by the people who buy the CGL policy or the common general liability policy. And the cyber insurance policy is something that is just added on. And so usually the insurance people and the people making the decisions know very little about the information security program. And the people in the information security department get handed a two-page survey that says, hey, fill this out. And so you can imagine where the frustration comes in, right? So we're going to talk about that. And we're going to hopefully be able to share with you today some of the reasons why we feel that you should look at cyber insurance and why you should still take a look at it and some tools that you could use and why we think you need it. And no, we don't sell insurance, by the way. <laughs> so, he already introduced us, but talk a little bit about risk-centric security, our tagline, risk analysis for the 21st century. Um, when we founded our company back in 2009, and this does have a point, I promise, um, we thought that the whole world should use quantitative risk analysis in, in for information security professionals. And we went, wrote a course, and we went in, and we thought, you know, everybody's got to do this. And you know, it's got to be this one way. And boy, that didn't really go over very well. That was really like trying to get the whole company to vote a straight ticket in the upcoming election. That just wouldn't happen. So we had to adapt. And uh, along the way, we met a few people. So 
Our guest didn't mention Ponmon, Larry Ponmon. How many people heard of the Ponmon Institute? Cost da data breach report? Good. So he and Patrick and I, we formed a great friendship. Um, he actually, in his reports, if you actually read them, he actually publishes his methodology. There was a point in time where he did not. Um, I'm not going to say that there was any influence there, but there may have been. So there's also another man, Mark Greisinger, who is with Net Diligence, the Cyber Claims Report. Has anybody ever heard of that report? Yeah. Okay, well, it's okay. Um, we've been involved with it um, for about five years. This year, we actually did all the data gathering and analysis, and we actually wrote the report. So you're in for a treat because you're going to get a sneak peek add a couple of diagrams and some information um, of this year's report before it's actually public, and it will be public on October 17th. And that report actually takes in real claims, data claims from insurance, paid claims from actual cyber, uh, cyber events and data breaches. So it's a very good report. I might be a little partial. So um, at any rate, um, we think that, um, like I said, it's, it's important. So as we go on, I think I made my point about, you know, risk-centric and meeting these other people and adapting. We didn't give up this whole concept of, you know, speaking the language of risk and teaching information security people to understand risk in that language, speaking the language. And that's what we've kind of continued and learning more about cyber insurance and understanding that helping the community and helping enable the people in InfoSec to understand, again, yet another language. And it really, when someone said, in fact, Patrick asked me one time, he said, so, Heather, what does ISO stand for? And I'm like, duh. Don't give it away. I'm not. <laughs> so, you know, I had to learn a whole whole nother language. And so we have traveled along um, the road and it continued. So this is my, um, what I will call, fit for purpose graph. Um, it is from uh, ZDNet's uh, thing. But I, what I thought was interesting, and I don't really know if you can see it, but we have it highlighted there. Um, this was their 2016 pr predictions graph um, on their trends. And cybersecurity insurance actually did make the trends for information security. Um, it's lumped in there with privacy, um, law enforcement, <laughs> legal as a whole group. So I don't know really how that counts, but like I said, it's my fit for purpose graph. So just to kind of highlight that it's the first time I've ever seen it show up in a graph and a trend, um, but I thought I'd throw it in there. So I'm going to actually hand this over to Patrick so he can start to talk a little bit more to and the meat of the presentation. Okay, well, hello, I'm Patrick Floor, um, and I get to throw some fear, uncertainty, and doubt your way. Usually, we're throwing it the way of other people, but uh, I just want to talk uh, about more than a few things. So these next four slides uh, just talk about some things that if you have information systems and information assets that uh, probably need to, to be on your mind, depending upon your line of business. This first slide are, are things, organizations, regulators who could impact your life after something happens. So a data breach, uh, a privacy breach, and, you know, you can read as well as I, oftentimes uh, at least a couple of them are involved in a data breach. The state attorneys general, the FDA, if you're uh, covered by the HIPAA high-tech uh, regulations, then you, you'll hear from the Office of Civil Rights at Human Health and Services, as well as the state attorneys general, and maybe some others. Um, if you operate a multinational or work for a multinational, um, you, if you haven't heard about the general data 
protection regulation that's going into effect, I would suggest that you inform yourself. It's got some very hefty penalties for uh, exposure of private data, up to 4% or 5% of annual gross revenues. So let that sink in. We're not talking 50 or or $100,000. Some companies could be on the hook for billions. Um, so these are the kinds of folks and organizations who might come knocking if something happens and they get wind of it. Um, how do you work this thing? Okay. Um, more and more, these regulators are getting in the proactive security business. I don't know how many of you, for example, saw the guidance a year or two ago from the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, I'm sure the people in the room who are involved in health care have heard about HIPAA audits. So all of these, and the FDA, uh, so post mic market guidance. I did used to work in medicine, so you, you may or may not know that every device or drug that hits the market really goes through four formal sets of testing, and, and the last one's called post-marketing, which is after the fact, you know, well, we thought this was a great pill or machine, but it's killing people. They really kind of expect uh, the doctors and hospitals to report on that, but the FDA does have the ability to halt the sale of drugs or the use of devices, and more and more uh, they're bringing information security into the picture, uh, which I happen to think is a good thing. Uh, the FTC has got several publications on the subject of privacy, on the subject of marketing to minors. Uh, I mean, there are just a myriad of things that, uh, you know, they, they decide they're going to get in your face before the fact. Um, there are various contractual arrangements you might have at your uh, company, service level agreements. Uh, you, you, know, you may have impossible to understand agreements with cloud providers. Um, I'm sure everybody in this room has sat through a talk uh, where somebody got up and said, you know, just sit down with Amazon and tell them how it's going to be. You know, negotiate a custom contract. Well, unless you're General Electric or Boeing or somebody like that, you know, good luck with that. Uh, has anybody in the room actually ever read one of the cloud service agreements from Amazon? Yeah, I've got some lawyers in the room by any chance. Okay, well then, yeah. So, uh, have you ever tried to negotiate with them? I'm just curious. Uh, not, the, not that company in particular, but some of the others that are just like them. Yeah. Uh, you will have to you know, redline and tell us what you want. And when I did, they said, yeah, we're not going to do that. Here's, here's our standard agreement, just like it was the first time. Yeah. Now, you know, we are told, because we attend a certain number of conferences with the legal focus, that occasionally people will have some luck. I have had, I, I have had luck with, with several of the very, very big names. Okay. I'm talking about the credit card company. Yeah. Okay. Uh, being more flexible, but, you know, circumstances dictate. Sure. How well, thank you for the input. It's, uh, it's good to learn that. Um, the big one most people have heard of probably is PCI. Um, I just want to be sure that everybody understands that PCI is not a statute or regulation. It is a function of contract law. And somebody in your organization signed an agreement once upon a time that included probably by reference uh, the, the mandatory compliance with whatever the PCI council said and that's why you're bound by PCI. So uh, I don't really, I, I'm not a lawyer but uh, one of my kids is so I'm friend, friendly to lawyers and uh, you know these are some things as Heather said in the beginning if you're going to sit down with the business side of the house, maybe you'll find somebody who's interested in firewalls or, uh, you know, encryption or some of the more technical things, but you, you probably need to understand their concerns and their language. And that's really something we've been talking about for five or six years. 
And with this presentation on cyber insurance and insurance, we're really moving beyond um, return on investment and some of the kind of financial lingo. We're, we're moving into a more specialized, but what we believe will be a pretty important area over the coming years. And hopefully, we'll provide some evidence to that effect. Um, now, the last thing to be worried about, occasionally people get sued. Um, occasionally there are class action suits over, well, not occasionally, all the time. Uh, there are class action suits uh, over data breaches. Um, the most interesting one to me that's going on right now is the Anthem suit, the, the disclosure of some 70 or 80 million uh, records of personal health information. We attended a conference in February, uh, Heather and I, it was actually most of the lawyers who were litigating that case from both sides. So you can imagine the panel got very interesting where you had the plaintiff's counsel and the defense counsel trying to be objective about what they were talking about. Somebody in the audience raised his hand and said, would you guys quit litigating the case at this conference? Go do that on your own time. So. Uh, and once in a blue moon, uh, depending, you could see criminal action. So obviously there's a lot to, to have on your mind as a security professional. Um, and so I want to talk about, you know, why, how insurance fits into this picture. Now, I'm not a CISSP. I'm actually, I have a CISM. I've, I've worked in risk for years and years. I'm actually a classical linguist, Greek and Latin, believe it or not. Uh, but that was 40-something years ago. Uh, when I studied for my exam for the CISM, they said, you know, there are four generally accepted mechanisms for dealing with risk. And we're going to talk in a minute about what I specifically mean by the word risk, because I think it's important to talk about that so that you all at least understand where I'm coming from. I really speak about risk from an actuarial point of view, even though I'm also not an actuary. Um, so you can eliminate risk. Now, what would that mean? Well, you could retire a legacy system. You could sell off a product line or a line of business. Eliminate risk means exactly what you think. You simply get rid of, by one mechanism or another, whatever it is that's causing the problem. Okay? If you have a have an asset that's full of asbestos, you know, you might try to, to put that off on somebody. The second thing, you can mitigate risk, which I think is the, the business that most of you in this room are, in, are doing, you know, uh, controls either technical policy, there are a lot of ways to do it. You can accept the risk, and that can be one of two things. Uh, you can just say it's a, it's a, low, it's a low frequency, low impact, kind of event, it's just not worth spending money to mitigate. Or uh, it may be residual risk, which means that you have implemented every control that's economically feasible in your context or organization, and uh, what's left is residual, and you just decide to live with it. And then lastly, you can transfer it, which is uh, where insurance comes in, uh, and other types of contractual arrangements. Okay, so I said I was going to talk about risk. So what is risk? Well, I'm going to start by saying what, in my view, risk isn't. Risk is not vulnerability, and risk is not threat. Uh, threats are threats, and vulns are vulns. It's pretty much that simple. They are important elements of a risk landscape, but they are not, in and of themselves, risk. And it's also highly contextual. So like this picture of the door, you know, maybe I've gone on vacation and left my front door open, or maybe I'm standing out there getting the newspaper. You know, it depends on how serious a vulnerability is on, on other factors that you have to know. Uh, threats, I like to think of in terms of credibility. I believe it comes from military doctrine that for a threat to be threatable, it has uh, credible, excuse me, threatable, has to meet three criteria. It has to have the capability to inflict harm or damage. Uh, the opportunity has to exist, and the motivation to execute the threat has to be present. If any one of those things are lacking, it's not really a credible threat. And I'll give an example, you know, close to home, our dear old state of Texas, 
just a footnote, I'm a native Dallas site, so I think I can, uh, I can speak with at least some genuineness here. In fact, we both are, both born here. Uh, there could be people in this room carrying concealed firearms with a legitimate license and right to do so. So certainly the capability is there. Uh, the opportunity is there because there are a bunch of us in here, but the motivation, hopefully, uh, is not there and won't be there at some point during my talk that I make somebody angry. Okay, So you kind of get the thing. It's a very important piece of the risk landscape, these two things, but in and of themselves, I don't think it's fair to call them risk. Risk is really one of these two items. It's either dollars or and or uh, an impairment of your mission. So what do I mean by mission impairment? Let's say that you don't really measure the effectiveness of your organization in dollars and cents. Think of the Marine Corps. Maybe they, you know, obviously money's important somewhere down the line, but mission is really their primary goal. So I believe strongly that risk really boils down to one or both of these things. If it, if it weren't going to hurt you financially, who would care about a data breach, right? You know, if there would be absolutely no impact on the pocketbook of any of these information security things, uh, we would all be looking for something else to do because nobody would care and nobody should care. Um, uh, if you've studied for an exam, you, you know that one of the questions has to do with annualized risk equals single loss occurrence times annual rate of occurrence. I think that's how that formula goes. That is actually from actuarial science. That's how actuaries think about this. But they, they get into a little more depth and they think of uh, frequency and impact as probability distributions. They don't ever peg on a single number, what I would call a point estimate. They try to take into account the range of uncertainty, both in the frequency and the impact. And it's the combination of those two things, sometimes multiplied together, sometimes just evaluated separately, but also together, that equates to what I think of as risk. And I think most business people would think of risk in that same way. The question you would be asked is, well, how likely is whatever going to happen? And how much is it going to cost us if it does? Uh, you know, and the problem we have in information security is, is not so much getting a handle on the how much it's going to cost, although that can be thorny. We've at least got some data points. But uh, the how frequently is this going to happen, that's, that's, the, that's the hard one. You know, we've got an intelligent adversary in many cases, an adaptive adversary, and, uh, you know, I, I could talk for a long time about that, but I think we've got to be done by 10 to 4, so I'm going to keep moving. Um, I'm going to, I got these out of order, I realized. So Heather mentioned that we were going to give you a sneak peek, if I can figure out how to make this thing work, uh, at some of the data from this report from Net Diligence. So as she said, Net Diligence is it's a company based in Philadelphia with heavy ties to both the insurance industry and the legal breach coach, breach defense community. And uh, this is one of the graphics we prepared for them. This is called a table of percentiles, if you don't recognize what you're seeing. And just mostly when, when people talk about these things, they tell you that one number that's highlighted in red, the average. Uh, but it's our view that an average without some demonstration of the variance in the data uh, is not terribly helpful. So one of the things you'll see here is that there's a factor of almost 12 between the median, that's to say half above and half below, and the average. Now these were preliminary real numbers from the analysis we did on, excuse me, When you get when you see the report and you look for these, you won't get them. 
Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. You, uh, you were the only ones who were getting these and not paying for it. Now, these are preliminary. They've been revised. They have changed. But in terms of the, the medians and the averages and really the distributions below about 90%, or the numbers, they're, they're pretty accurate. So this is money that in, uh, we had a, a 20 companies submitted uh, case data. It's 173 actual claims that were paid. And the median was 54,000 as the total breach cost. The average was 650. And the biggest one, it says 20 million there. We actually revised that down due to a correction. Yes. I'm, come, I'm going to come to that. All right. Okay. So, you know, well, maybe I should say a word about it quickly. Breaches obviously have uh, many different cost components. There's a whole set of cost components called crisis management or crisis services. Uh, you have fines with regulators. You might uh, pay damages to settle lawsuits. You're certainly, almost certainly, going to have legal fees. Even if you have in-house counsel, uh, the consensus, of course, of the breach coach outside counsel is you really need them because they're experts and, and they make a good case for that. But mainly what I want to show you is this is a, a more, this is a richer way of telling you something than just you know, the average was $650,000. For those who are somewhat statistically savvy, you'll see right off the bat that this is a highly skewed uh, distribution of data. If we had presented a histogram, this, these, these 97th and 99th numbers would be way out to the right. Yes? Kind of a, a case in point is that if we go in and there's a lot of research on cost per record, where you have the, the variance there, $200 per record, PII, and so forth. But when I actually spoke with somebody who was a CISO and unfortunately had uh, a breach, they made a declaration that it actually cost them seven to eight dollars per record. And you know, from a security professional, you balk and you say, What do you mean? And the reality is they they, they went out and said that when they went and said you have to go notify them, the people who actually responded to get that the, the required you know protections and things of that nature was extremely low. So, so when they went let back me, and through and calculated it, it wasn't that two hundred dollars. Let, let me make a couple of comments. So Larry Ponamon and I became friends because I challenged his methodology on two hundred dollars a record. Just cold. I just sent an email to info at Ponamon. I said, I don't think this makes sense. My phone rang three hours later, and we talked for an hour and he invited me to a conference. And you know, I've become a fellow at his institute. Now the important thing I want to say, what if I told you that I have empirical data, which I do, that I had a claim at my company, it wasn't my company, but it's in our database, that we had a single record breached and we paid a million and a half dollars to two million dollars to clear everything up pertaining, pertaining to that record. Now, we have a little contradiction going on here. $8 a record, I can believe that in some cases. $2 a record, I can believe in some cases. A million and a half dollars in some cases, I can believe, I can document. So the, the take home message there is, these numbers are really all over the place and I've been trying to model this for years. And uh, you know, you can get a little ways down the road with a logarithmic, if that makes any sense to you approach to these data, but then you can also say, well, gee, just about everything, you know, in terms of loss exposure and insurance models on a logarithmic scale. So, um, you know, the fact is that your, your guy was not wrong that you're citing. I'm not wrong. I could cite plenty of other examples in between. Um, we just don't know and we, we don't really understand how these breaches scale. Now, in fairness, I, I, we have several talks on deconstructing the cost of a data breach, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. But I'm glad you raised the point because it's, a, it's as I like to say, it's about clear as mud, you know? Well, I just, to follow up though, is, okay, so as a CISO, what, the question is, what is my exposure, right? So what is the cost per record 
what is it that if I have this many records, should I insure against, right? Or what should I Well, I, we're, we're going to address that. So one of the things you see here is that the median cost is about 50 grand. Now bear in mind insurance, one of the things Ponemon does, he's the only one who does it, and I give him credit for this, about two-thirds of his number, you know, about $130 of his 200, and it's been give or take 10 or $15 of 200, you know, uh, for the last 10 years. He attempts to get people to estimate brand damage, customer churn, and a bunch of intangible soft stuff that nobody's willing to go out on the line and talk about. Now, and that's another hour discussion. You know, does brand damage really exist? Does customer churn exist? Uh, j just a second, I'll come to you. Um, and, and again, it depends. Um, and I, I, boy, I wish I had all day because we could have a long discussion. But yes, sir, in the sun lessons. I surgery back and go see what it looks like inside. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. From eye surgery. Oh, okay. I thought you were raising your hand. I was. Okay. The doctor can go and look inside today and learn drops are not your best friend. Oh, gosh. I'm sorry. Well, I was on the operating table Wednesday afternoon oh. with catheters in my heart. So oh. I think there's hope for both of us. I agree. <laughs> so I'm yes. I'm curious on data for negligence. Uh, we got commissioned by this insurance magazine to write an article based off another article. Which is titled Never Pay a Cyber Claim Again. And it was called the court filing that we did for a law firm. Uh huh. And I'm curious, is there any negligence data in this data? Uh, we, you know, that's the, the short answer is no, but probably. Uh, we, we don't have it stratified out quite at that level of detail. So in the net diligence data, we, we capture. Well, let me, let me talk about it when we get to cyber insurance, but I, there's nothing I can point to in the net diligence data to say of this settlement or of this regulatory fine, so much money was specifically attributable to negligence. I mean, we just, you know, we don't know. I'm not even sure that the insurers necessarily know or that they even care. You, you know, maybe they do. I mean, it'd be in, you're, you're an attorney, right? No, okay. There was somebody, oh, it's the guy, the fellow sitting next to you. Yeah. Um, maybe we can talk afterwards. But anyway. Um, if I may, what the issue is this. They're tired of paying the claims. There was an obscure article in the, the Texas uh, Criminal Defense Attorneys that we picked up. We wrote a memorandum with that where it led us to pay the company for a bunch of research. And it turns out that the majority of the time now, you can prove the company insured, the corporation, is negligent, which is their goal, because they don't want to keep paying out that target. But they can accept all of your premiums, and then they're going to charge you negligence on one document that has just a list of things you have to do, which the corporation has never been around to. So if you do the SANS top 20, then you're liable for every attack after 21. And this is an approach that they're going for. So I've had this conversation with underwriters and carriers and lawyers representing the same. And normally it would be easy for me to uh, accept a cynical explanation. But I think what they've told me is, at least in the Fortune 1000, these are very important business relationships. They involve lots of profits. And, and the last thing an insurer wants to do at least in that group of companies, is deny a claim. That's a special class. Well, yeah, I, I would agree. Now, there's, there's only one case I'm aware of, and I haven't looked lately. Uh, it was uh, one of the big insurers a year or two ago filed suit to recover money they paid under a cyber policy uh, on the grounds that it turned out the company had insufficient, however that was defined, information security, uh, policies, processes, and technology. The, you know, the, the people in the room at the Net Diligence Conference that year were understandably concerned about that, but, you know, I, that case may even have been dropped. I mean, so I guess I'm kind of disagreeing with you, at least at a certain level. I mean, uh, and we're going to talk a little more about that. I, I got to keep motoring because the previous talk ran late, and I tend to talk a lot, too, so I don't want to 
subject everybody to that. So this is, these are the actual breach costs. And then these are the payouts. And even though you, you may not have made notes, you see that the average is still way up around the 80th to 90th percentile. And it's still uh, 10 or 11 times the median. So the lesson here is, at least in the data set that the insurers have been willing to provide to net diligence, I'm being very careful with my words here. I'm not saying this represents the whole world. That's the big question. Are studies like this, or Verizon, or Panamon, or Mandiant, or anybody, do they really have external validity, to use a phrase from medicine? Do they really, are they really legitimate indicators of the world at large, and we simply don't know yet. Maybe when we have enough of them, if they start to line up, you know, that we start to see the same kind of findings. But, you know, some people have said, well, okay, average payout. Well, first of all, some people don't get the difference between a, an insurance claim payout and an insurance breach cost. So the difference between this average or any of these numbers and the ones before, basically the deductible or what they call in commercial insurance, the self-insured retention, which is technically slightly different. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but, you know, the, in the Panaman report, they said, uh, Larry says, and I know him well enough that I'm, I'm not being presumptuous to call him by his first name, says that the average cost of a breach is like four, five, six million dollars. Well, how do you reconcile that? Not, this is the wrong graph, but say with this one, was $650,000. Well, uh, I don't think you can write up the whole difference to uh, customer churn and lost business. It's just one of those questions out there in the marketplace. We don't know the answer to this yet. And, you know, given my background, I think it's our duty in the net diligence report simply to describe what people gave us. And, you know, we... D yes, sir? Net diligence is only... Uh, reporting actual claim, insurance claims against cyber yeah. policies, though, right? Yeah. So yeah. they wouldn't be claiming, or they wouldn't be calculating uninsured claims. There well, there, there are a number of limitations. So in these numbers, we, we usually know what the retention or deductible is. Right. So that's factored into these numbers, but most insurance policies have limits, exclusions, all sorts of things that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So. I really view these numbers as a lower bound, if that makes sense. You know, it's pretty safe to say that it probably didn't cost less than these numbers. Where the, where the roof is, you know, we're not quite sure, okay? So let me now go back up here. So I thought those slides, I should have put them after the risk slide because that's really, you know, they go together. So I, I want to talk briefly and the Legal people in the room can, can correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm studying for my commercial broker's license, not particularly because I want to sell insurance at age 67, but I think it might, you know, help dealing with some of the people who are our clients to at least, at least demonstrate I made an effort to, you know, get into their world. So in my view at this point, subject to change tomorrow, or if somebody corrects me, insurance has two primary pur purposes, indemnification and defense. Now, subject to fine print, you know, the devil's in the details, but by and large, insurance is intended to make you whole, which is not the same as make you new. It's to try to get you back to the point where you were the moment before whatever event it was happened, which is why they don't buy you a new car when you crash one that's 10 years old. So that's, that's one important purpose of just about every insurance contract. The other important purpose is to defend you against lawsuits uh, subject to the term and, terms and conditions of the policy. So, I mean, in my simple-minded way of thinking about this, those are the two biggies. Now, there, there may be other purposes, but certainly there will be these. Okay, we looked at those. So I want to talk for a second about some of the key players quickly because remember this is a cyber insurance did you know and it may be that everybody in this room knows all this stuff but it may be that some of you don't. So here are the players. Uh, there's a, a trick question on this slide. 
uh, I'll come to it. So the insured, well, that obviously is, you know, you, me, our company. Uh, it's the person who needs to be protected for some reason. The broker and or agent uh, operates either on a fee basis or uh, a commission built into the cost of the insurance. Uh, really represents or should represent the best interests of the insured. It's not like residential real estate where the realtor represents the seller. In, in this business, uh, the, the broker and the agent are really supposed to look out for the best interests of the client. Uh, the underwriter, well, these are the people who evaluate the risks, decide, you know, whether they're going to take a client or not. The actuaries, these are the math geeks, the numbers people who I like to think sit in dark rooms with lampshade, green lampshades and, you know, visors and pencils and columnar pads, if anybody in this room even remembers what those were uh, before spreadsheets. Then you've got the insurer, the carriers, those are the people who write the checks who ultimately take on the risk, and then you have the ISO, and that's the trick question. Anybody know what the ISO is? It's not the one you think it is. It's not the International Standards Organization. It is the Insurance Services Office. That was a new one on me two years ago, so don't feel bad. So who's the insurance office? Well, they are a for-profit uh, subsidiary or or owned company of somebody else whose name I forget, and they do at least a couple of things. They maintain huge actuarial databases on things like weather, car accidents, uh, probably life tables, you know, reasons people die, and maybe more importantly, they are the repository of the standard contracts or paper. Uh, I'm told that they maintain a library of seven or 8,000 standardized forms, and I'm told that, for example, many of the, the forms we might have seen when buying a house that might say FHA or Fannie Mae, that many of these actually come from these folks. So uh, if anybody mentions the insurance services office, that's who they are. Uh, the parent company owns a number of other companies. One, one of interest to me, I sat on a, a panel with one of their PhD mathematicians uh, last year, it's called AIR Worldwide, and their job is catastrophe modeling. And so, obviously, you know, they employ these people with sophisticated math and computer skills to apply what they've learned on forecasting weather, hurricanes, tornadoes, and earthquakes to try to figure out data breaches. They're not having much luck. That's all I can tell you. Nobody's having much luck, but we're, we're all trying. Uh, so some key terms, um, you know, you can read, so the policy is pretty obvious. Uh, the policy has different named legal components like a declarations page and endorsements and riders. Um, you have risk and then what the insurance people tend to call perils, which I kind of think of as, as threats really or exploits, but a peril is a specific something or other that causes an event like a tornado would be a peril. A hurricane would be a peril. I guess in their way of thinking, a, a hack that led to the exposure of data would be a peril. Okay, retention. Well, I mentioned retention is pretty much like deductible with an exception. In most cases, if say you have a $10 million coverage with a $500,000 retention, you actually have to spend that $500,000 before they'll start paying out. So it, doesn't work like on car insurance if, if somebody, you know, if you run into somebody and have a $500 deductible, they usually, at least in my experience, write you a check for the estimate and they subtract the $500. You don't actually have to spend $500 before they process your claim. Not necessarily so in the commercial insurance or cybersecurity. Limits and sublimits, pretty much exactly what you'd think. Some of the stuff we've seen and the claims that we've analyzed they might say, okay, we're going to cover credit monitoring, but only for 5,000 people. Or we're going to cover public relation expenses, but only up to $50,000. We're, you know, we're going to uh, require you to use our legal people. You know, you can't use your own. Or if you want to use your own, 
you know, we'll cap the hourly rate and the number of hours. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty much what you would think. Um, exclusions, well, uh, you know, we're not going to cover this. We're not going to cover that. Uh, and I've got some interesting things, I think, to say about that in a minute. And then the whole concept of what is reinsurance? You know, you see these companies called Swiss Re, Munich Re, uh, Allianz Re. Well, the easiest way to think of reinsurance is insurance for insurance companies. So it's typically uh, big amounts of money, uh, you know, further removed from potential loss. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's enough to say. So some types of general business insurance, CG. There's a whole new set of acronyms. Isn't that great? So, you know, we know DDoS. We know all these different things. But now it's time. You know, the one I got the biggest kick out of was K&R. So I don't know if anybody in here is billionaire plus or, or related to, but kidnap and ransom insurance, you know, that actually is such a thing, and it's very valuable to some people and companies. Uh, so you can read this as well as I can. Um, you know, the lawyers in the room will certainly understand errors in emissions insurance. That's, that's uh, one of the ways they protect themselves from mistakes. Uh, and the last one here, well, CGL, let me say a word about that, um, really covers tangible property and injury to persons primarily. It doesn't really do much for cyber, except we heard a pretty interesting talk from an attorney at a conference back to this insurance services office. Some of the older paper on CGL actually can be interpreted to cover cyber events. The newer policies that they've been writing the last couple of years specifically exclude cyber. So if you have a policy and you're on an older contract, you may have to hire a friendly attorney to kind of do a little persuasion of the insurance company if you have a cyber event. You're probably better off just to bite the bullet and look at cyber insurance. But I thought that was kind of interesting, that there's actually been some successful litigation, unfortunately, to force insurance companies to cover under CGL. But they're trying to get rid of it as fast as they can. Crime insurance, this was one that's so counterintuitive to me, I don't know what to say. So if you're the victim of a criminal hack, a crime, guess what? Crime insurance won't cover you. <laughs> okay? Yeah, you're looking kind of astonished. That was kind of the look I had on my face when I was told that. Crime insurance has to do, again, with tangible property. It doesn't have to do with intangible assets. At least that's the way I understand it. So, oh my gosh, we're almost out of time. Okay, I'm going to claim five minutes past because the other guy was up here for five minutes too long. Okay, you going you gonna to shut me down? Yes. You are? Okay, good luck with that. Um, so, you know, you can, you can read this. One of the interesting things I'll point out here is if you wanted to go out and buy a $500 million cyber policy and you, you were willing to pay whatever price, except $500 million, you probably couldn't get it. There is insufficient capacity in the market at this point, although it's growing, to write much more than about $100 million. And so that's where you come into this concept of insurance towers. Uh, I don't know for a fact, but I would assume that Target and Home Depot, each of which said publicly that they had $100 million of coverage, probably had a whole bunch of people involved in that. So you've got your primary insurer, maybe takes the first 10 or $20 million, and then you've got a whole bunch of different companies, each of whom uh, insure a tranche or a slice. They, when they build it up, they call it a tower. So, you know, the higher up the tower you are, probably the less risk as an insurer you have, although, as we've learned, it's not too hard to run up a quarter billion dollar uh, expense tab on a big data breach if you're a big company, both Target and Home Depot. Captive insurance, this one is really fascinating to me. It's basically self-insurance, but it's a legal framework for tax purposes so the captive insurance company is really a separate entity. The parent company wholly owns the captive insurer, or maybe a group of companies, pays premiums to the captive, just like an insurance company, and 
you know, the captive company settles all the claims, but there are apparently some, some tax advantages. These things have been around for about 50 years or more. Highly specialized work, you know, you have to get real legal and accounting experts to set one of these things up, although there's starting to be a market for uh, cash and carry, if you will, captives. You know, managed service captive insurance company. Um, with cyber coverage, the devil is in the details. Now, I said earlier that I'd talk about what does it typically cover? Well, business disruption and uh, restoration costs. So if you're DDoSed and you lose money, and you have to spend money to get back up and running, uh, many policies will cover that. Network intrusions, if they have an impact, data exposure. The biggest thing we see in the net diligence data are the various expenses for what they call crisis management services, as listed there. And uh, there's legal guidance, at least in the net diligence report, there's a, actually it's a registered trademark of net diligence, breach coach. It's, it's legal advice for dealing with the state's attorney general, dealing with the regulators. It's, it's not to defend you, although there may be somebody else in the same firm who does that. So breach coach is a term, you, if you haven't run across, you'll start running across it. Um, it's, oh my God, we've got a data breach, you know, our, our in-house general counsel isn't quite sure what to do, whom do we call? You, you call a breach coach. Uh, forensics, pretty obvious, notification and credit monitoring, everybody knows what that is. Cyber insurance will also usually uh, pay your regulatory fines and legal costs as well as uh, civil, civil, uh, civil actions and lawyers, uh, what's the word for that? Just, I call them settlements, but anyway. Okay, now here's maybe some interesting stuff. I told you that crime insurance probably doesn't uh, cover theft of information. Um, cyber coverage may not cover a lot of things that you think it should cover. And that's why you really need to review these contracts uh, with, you know, competent experts. And interestingly, uh, cyber coverage might usually pay for the forensics and restoration around, say, a ransomware attack, but it won't pay the ransom. And it almost certainly won't pay uh, any amounts of money you wire transferred to China or Romania on the basis of fraudulent inducement from a phishing attack. They, the insurers tend to take the position that was a willful act. Willful acts aren't covered. They'll pay for the forensics and the other stuff. So um, that's pretty much our presentation. Um, One point on that, though, and sure. as we wrap up, um, since we're over, on the, um, the ransomware, the, there is another one, the blackmail um, the email scams that, the, that they're running. The FBI has set up a uh, bank uh, fraud email like uh, kill chain. So uh, if you are a victim of not a ransomware per se, uh, where you, uh, they said, you know, whatever. But if you actually, if there's a scam, if an email scam, if you catch up within the first 48 hours, you call the FBI, they'll get your money back in the first 48 hours. So they have that uh, trans they have those agreements with the banks that they can get your money back. Most people don't catch it within the first 48 hours, that's the key, but just to pass that information on to you. Okay, well thank you all very much. Hopefully you know a few things you didn't know before you walked in the room. And uh, we'll get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs>